We're giving everyone just a chance to catch up. Uh, we appreciate you joining us this evening as we dive into Avella with Dan Orr. Uh, we are going to review a little bit of the history of diving, uh, as well as how Avella became a solution, how Avella works, and we will hear from Dan about some of his personal experiences diving the system as part of our pilot program. Uh, we also uh, will take a look at some of how Avello works uh, as a company, uh, how you'll be able to experience Avello uh, and maybe fit it into your future someday. So we're waiting just a couple more minutes. We're still just two minutes after the clock before we get into our formal introductions. Uh, we're all scuba divers here. Uh, I don't know about all of you, uh, but we're all scuba divers here presenting this evening and really excited to be sharing uh, this product with you tonight and explaining new ways for managing buoyancy uh, and you know, lightening the load uh, on the industry just a little bit. I'm full of all kinds of bad, catchy phrases. Uh, I'm a scuba instructor, and uh, when I do my tired diver toe, I like to tell people that this is a real drag. <laughs> <laughs> nice, nice. <laughs> so I apologize in advance for the cheese. Uh, we also have someone coming in from Virginia Beach. So Virginia is well, another person from Virginia Beach. So people are well represented over there today. Rock and roll. Um, shall we start our formal introductions? We'll give people just another minute or two to, to sign in. I can talk a little bit about what I do. Uh, I have helped create some of the imagery that you're seeing today uh, and our logo. Uh, and I dive around the world shooting photography, videos, and leading expeditions. Uh, as well as teaching uh, students bad jokes. <laughs> I'm just as uh, cheesy when I lead my dive expeditions too. Uh, I just got back from leading a whale shark trip and I told my guests it gave a new meaning to chasing tail. <laughs> I didn't say I was politically correct, but I thought it was funny. <laughs> So uh, in just another minute, uh, we'll, we'll introduce, see, I got a laugh. Somebody likes my bad jokes. <laughs> Meanwhile, we just lost five participants. <laughs> <laughs> we like to have fun here uh, and we love the culture of scuba diving. We appreciate everybody um, for, for spending time with us this evening to hear about revolutionary new technology, uh, what makes our uh, product different, what the Avello system is, and uh, what are the components of the Avello system? So we have here tonight uh, our CEO, Aviad Kahana. He is a scuba instructor and an engineer and the inventor of Avello. So he will bring all the in-depth information that you uh, could ever want to know about this product. We also have with us diving expert, Dan Orr. Uh, you may recognize him as the former CEO of the Divers Alert Network. He now is also president of Dan Orr Consulting uh, in the scuba industry. And uh, we are very excited to talk with him this evening, learn about his insights uh, for diving the system in our pilot program. We are just concluding the pilot program. And at the end of the presentation, we will talk about what some of our next steps are. We'll also uh, have the chat window open the whole time. And I will be moderating and letting you know um, what the questions are at the end. So at the end of the presentation, uh, we'll answer the questions. If you don't wanna forget it, go ahead and write it down in the chat or at the end, feel free to add your questions there. Um, some of the questions may get answered during this presentation. Uh, and we also welcome all comments. So we love everyone here tonight who is part of our Avello Diving community. And without further ado, I wanna turn it over to Aviad. Hello. Thanks, Jennifer. So Jennifer started on the uh, joke uh, streak. <laughs> we, this is ours. Um, the, this is how this all started. With scuba being one of the heaviest objects in the universe, um, we're still chasing who actually made that meme for the first time. We gave credit here, but if anybody knows who made this, please let us know. We'll shake his hand one day. 
Um, this all started from the understanding that scuba started heavy and just stayed heavy and even became heavier. And in this presentation, our goal is to talk about the causes for this. Why is scuba gear so heavy? Was it always that heavy? Then is it just weight or are there other issues with scuba? And what can we do to make it better? The first question is why must scuba gear be so heavy? And really the answer is simple. It is because it is very buoyant. When you look at, if you look at the complete scuba set and you take a standard wetsuit and an empty BC, even an empty one, and a tank, and you look at how much water they displace, you get about 70 pounds of water, which means that their buoyant force is 70 pounds. That's a lot of force. In order to counter that and be neutral, you need to take 70 pounds of a mass, which is the counter force. And it doesn't matter if that mass comes from a lightweight tank or, or an addition of weight. At the end of the day, however way your setup is, you must carry 70 pounds of gear just to be neutral. And then on top of it, you must carry the air too, which is about six pounds of air in a standard scuba tank. And an average diver today carries something like 70 to 75 pounds. That is a lot of weight. If you want to see how much weight that is, um, the way that weight is being perceived or the exertion of, of carrying weight is being perceived is was documented by uh, many industries and the Navy and the Army. And the way that it works is it is based on your percentage of body weight. So when you take the average person and you look at how much weight is comfortable and you look at their percent of butt, you get that at the 40, between 30 and 40 pounds, it's still comfortable. The 42 or the 40 to 50 pounds range, things are uncomfortably heavy, but maybe manageable. As soon as you go above the 50, things exponentially feel a lot heavier. And that's why scuba gear feels so heavy because although it's only 10 or 20 pounds heavier, it is extremely heavy, and then you go really fast, really fast into the no, not worth it, and then you know Thor's hammer is here at the end. As an industry, we're here, we're somewhere here, we're in between these ranges, and that's what we carry on our back all the time. Forty percent of body weight, double the the comfortable zone, and while every other industry, mountain biking and climbing and skiing and you name it is racing towards lighter and more efficient gear, we're still here. And so in order to start and look at how to solve this, we need to go back to the beginning and look at how scuba started. And it started with a tank and a regulator, an OBCD. The, the tank, the, excuse me, the amount of air in the tank was about the same. It's about six pounds. So people got in the water and knowing that they're gonna lose these six pounds of air, they had to start the dive about six pounds negatively buoyant or heavy. So the dive, you breathe about five pounds of air and then towards the end of the dive, you're about neutral. So that was the common practice. The issue is it's not comfortable or safe. When you look at lung control versus buoyancy, the reason that it's not comfortable is the way that we, the way that the diver like that will have to do their buoyancy is by controlling their lungs. And the lung has an exchange volume that is called the tidal volume. That's when we all, are all here in a room breathing comfortably and just sitting on a chair. We exchange something like about 500 milliliters of volume. If you translate that to buoyancy change, it's about one pound of change. And it's called the tidal volume. So a diver goes in six pounds heavy and have a, a one pounds of buoyancy to play with is very unbalanced, which causes now they need to swim more and, and it's a lot more effort to get the dive. But as we mentioned, this mass of gas is consumed and towards the end of the dive, they got to a point where those forces balance themselves out and suddenly you are very neutral and very stable 
and it's a, it's a sensation that we don't really have today. Uh, ultra stable neutral buoyancy is achieved when these forces balance each other out and those divers could ascend or descend, descend um, without a problem. And it felt like magic. The issue with that is that it's only less towards the last few minutes of the dive because only then you have this perfect balance. So to solve for the most of the dive, we added the BCD. So the BCD is really a balloon that sits on our back and added buoyancy. It definitely fixed the beginning of the dive, but it also added other elements. Um, even a, an empty BC is added volume, which requires added weight. But the biggest problem that the BCD added is a large bubble or a large compressible volume. The compressible volume, when you look at the standard tank and the and standard setup today, even if you're weighed, weighted perfectly, you're still carrying something like almost eight pounds of, um, of positive force or eight pounds of air in the BC. So if we compare a BC to a balloon, it's a balloon that can carry something like between eight and 10 pounds. That would be the size of a gallon milk jug. It's a pretty large bubble. If you take a reference depth and you look at what this descent of even a small number of, uh, even a small depth change here, you will get a large buoyancy difference because bubbles tend to expand and contract like that. It has to do with the physics and it's, it's their uh, radius. Um, to... If you take small bubbles, they don't change that much in buoyancy. So the smaller the bubble, the better it is. If you compare our tidal volume that we said before is about one pounds to the eight to 10 pounds bubble that we carry on our back, it's very easy to understand why as soon as you start to ascend just a little bit, you get a large buoyancy change and the resulting buoyant force is exponentially growing upwards or downwards. And there's a big imbalance between this one pounds to the eight to 10 pounds that we carry on our back. It's like trying to, to control a lift bag with our lungs. To define all of this, we, we coined the zone of stable neutral buoyancy. And the, the emphasis here is on the word stable. The meaning of the zone is how many feet you can ascend or descend without needing to touch your BCD and while breathing normally, not really expanding yourself and extending yourself on breathing. With a BC today, it is very limited because that large bubble will very quickly get you out of the zone and you'll have to adjust. Um, and that's the thing that neutral buoyancy today is very unstable. If you look at, at the stability of neutral buoyancy with respect to the size of the compressible volume, you see that the smaller the compressible volume can be, the wider that zone is. And the, the, it translates to how, fun, how much fun you have in the dive and your safety. So smaller compressible volume is what we want, which is why those early divers at the end of the dive, they only had the wetsuits on them and it's a very small compressible volume. And they could go up and down the water column and where they stopped swimming, they just hover. Um, small compressible volume directly translates to ultra stable neutral buoyancy. And that's what we want. So a bit about the wetsuit and, and the wetsuit is a compressible volume because that's something that, that comes up a lot. Wetsuits are made out of neoprene. It's a closed cell um, neoprene, you know, it's a closed cell rubber. And it really is essentially a lot of little bubbles that are trapped inside a media made out of rubber. It's not that easy to compress because you have to fight the rubber and you also have the trapped air inside. We did a lot of experiments. Wetsuits don't compress like what we think. What happens with a wetsuit at depth is that they really lose minimal amount of volume. They get flooded and they compress a little bit, but they're nowhere near the large air pocket that we have on our back as a BC, and so they don't behave like that. Wetsuits, even thick ones, are a very minor compressible volume. 
and the BCD is not really needed to compensate for wetsuit compression. It's needed to balance the additional weight that we carry through the dive, and it really is required to balance itself as we change depth in the water and that large pocket compresses and decompresses. When you take this all and you, you summarize it, you get that today's scuba philosophy is to add more gear, which trans translates to two things, a lot more weight and the instability of natural buoyancy. What we do today is we take a tank, heavy as it may be, and then because it have air in it, we know that we have to, we're gonna lose that air, so we have to take more weights. Then we added the BC and we added even more weight. And that translates to a large balloon and a heavy object that we need to balance out. It's inherently unstable and it's cumbersome. So the thought was, what if instead of adding buoyancy, what if we could just remove it? What if you could really attack the problem at the source? If we know that the, at the beginning of the dive, we're heavy by six pounds, you go back to the early days of diving, and through the dive, you're gonna lose a bit of air and then more air, and that's the issue. What if we had a tank that can lose buoyancy in proportion to this same phenomena of losing mass? In other words, the tank that becomes smaller on you. The solution comes in the form of a tank that has a lightweight shell and has an internal bladder that can handle us putting water through the dive into that tank. It's essentially the same thing. It's a tank that loses buoyancy by losing its own volume, but it's a lightweight tank with an inner bladder and it has a lot of advantages. First of all, it provides flotation when you need it because we're talking about a much lighter tank than today's tank. Um, so it gives you the flotation when you need it. And then you use ambient water, which is plentiful in diving for buoyancy adjustment, just like submarines do. The, the biggest advantage is that it doesn't change buoyancy as a result of ambient pressure because it's two different things. It's like having a tank that simply becomes smaller. It, it is not reactive to ambient pressure, to the pressure around you. The manifestation of this solution is the Arvelo system, which is composed of two things. We have the hydro tank, which is the tank I just described. It has a lightweight carbon fiber shell uh, externally. It has a bladder internally, and it has a water chamber. And when you fill that tank and it's filled with standard scuba gear, it is filled to usually 3,000 PSI, 3,300. It can be filled more, but that's usually what we fill it to. This bladder will expand and will take the entire, the entire inner volume of the tank. And then we couple that with a system that has, we call the jetpack. It has a pump that pumps water in, that is battery operated. It has a battery that runs water or runs the pump, so water will go into the tank. And it has a purge valve so you can allow water out of the tank. There's an on-off button here. The system is manual. And all it does is it takes the tanks and it either puts water in or it allows the bladder to uh, expand and push water out. Only the pump is dependent on the battery for power. You can always make the tank larger by purging water out. When you put this whole system together, it looks like this. Uh, and this is not a mistake that the tank is actually uh, pointing away from the diver. We found that that's an easier way to dive. We'll talk about this later. But this is the system. You have a pump and a battery. They're designed to uh, fill the tank with water when you need it. And you have a purge valve that allows you to remove water from the tank when you need that too. And this system is already DOT and CE approved. The way that it all comes together to a dive is you jump in the water and you have a lightweight tank. So you are buoyant just like submarines are. When you're ready to go, it takes us a while to get ready to go. Here we go. When you're ready to go, you press the button and the tank will start to fill with water. So water goes from the outside through the pump and just fill the tank and the bladder will compress and you become 
heavier because of the weight of the water. When you're ready to go, you swim down. And this is a new sensation in scuba. You swim down. You don't fall down. There's no free fall. There's no need for it because you're neutral. And you keep that neutrality from the surface to any depth that you will go to, even if you're diving very heavy wetsuits. The only thing that changes in terms of buoyancy is the mass. So when we breathe, mass leaves the tank and we become ever so slightly more and more buoyant. It takes about 20 minutes to become buoyant enough to fill it. And then when you are, all you need to do is to touch the button and add more water to the tank. You don't need a lot. Usually in 20 minutes, an average diver will go through about a pound to a pound and a half of air. So you put a pound to a pound and a half of water in the tank. It's really quite simple in terms of buoyancy control. The rest is done with your lungs. Again, the tidal volume is plenty to do um, all the buoyancy needed. And the benefit is through the entire dive, you are in this zone of stable neutral buoyancy that was considered magical in the early days of scuba. Ascent is the same way. If you don't swim, there's no reason to go anywhere. You're always neutral. Um, safety stops looks exactly like that. When you stop swimming, you just hover. And we do that when we teach all the time. When you're ready after the safety stop and you go up and you see all that water in the tank. So this diver is now neutral. They're just swimming up. And when they get to the surface, they just purge and they become, they become positive, as you can see. Now there's no water in the tank, climbing back into the, the boat is even easier or on shore, and it's, it's even lighter than it was before. So what we learned over a thousand dives, we're now well over a thousand dives. Um, velo diving is much more intuitive. This whole concept of having buoyancy down with your lungs is instant. Uh, lung control is just second nature. And that's, if you think about it for, especially for recreational divers, um, it's an instant link because there's no other, there's no noise. There's no BC that pulls you up or pulls you down. For professional divers, it's just very intuitive because that's how we do our buoyancy in many ways anyway, except here, you have a much wider zone of stability. Um, we find that air consumption significantly improves, especially for inexperienced divers, because there is no mysterious force that is working um, on you. And the overall diving experience is simply boosted. Things are effortless. There's a lot less drag underwater because there's no sail on you that you can swim. The hydrodynamics is better. It's better above and below the water. Um, it's easier to use and it's easier to teach and it is safer. And with that, I'm gonna ask Dan to comment. Okay, if, if, actually, if you can put it back on that slide for just a moment. Um, and I started diving back in 1964, and back in those days, we didn't have buoyancy devices and things were effortless. And it was uh, absolutely amazing to me to use a system like this, because when I saw the uh, presentation that Avello did uh, at the DEMA show last year, uh, like a lot of us in the room, and we were skeptical because we are traditional divers to be using buoyancy devices for a long time. And there were a lot of assumptions that we were making. And some of these things really were against some of those assumptions. But when I had an opportunity to use it, um, everything that's said here on this slide is absolutely true. Um, lung control does become second nature because when you reach that zone of neutral buoyancy, uh, you really can feel that slight change of buoyancy just by breathing in and out. So it is like back in the old days when we were uh, able to control our buoyancy through lung control, lung volume control. And the other thing that was talked about too had to do with the weight of the equipment. Now, one of the webinars that I do has to do with safety issues for the older diver. 
And when you talk about load tolerance and how much weight is on your back, one of the concerns uh, is for the older diver. You may not have that same load tolerance that some young people do. And it's very difficult for them to climb out of the water and uh, get into the water with all that heavy equipment on. And and so something like this is, is really, really important. And the hydrodynamics streamlining is really important because it does reduce the workload on you. And so you're not doing as much work and your breath control is better, your air consumption is lower. So there are a lot of things that are really important um, that really make this system unique. And also, excuse me, also above and below the water, <coughs> excuse me, sorry, I'm choking here. Um, but above and below the water, we did a dive where we had a long swim back to the boat. And without having the drag from a BCD, uh, we were able to get to the boat very quickly, very easily without doing a whole lot of work. Uh, excuse me. Um, and it is easier to use and easier to teach. And one of the issues that I have a significant concern about has to do with COVID and people coming back to diving from a long absence, because a lot of us have not been in the water in a year or two or three or even longer. And with a system that is less complicated, it makes it a lot easier for us to get, ba <clears throat> get back in the water. Sorry, it's so dry out here. Uh, yeah, so it makes it a lot easier for us to get back in the water. It makes it the teaching of the equipment a lot better. And of course, it is safer than today's systems. Okay, next. <clears throat> so today's gear does cause, cause rapid buoyancy changes. And one of the big issues, one of the big safety issues has to do with the loss of buoyancy control. In fact, in 2008, Divers Alert Network did a research project where we reviewed 947 fatalities. And one of the things that I in particular looked at were the triggering events. Uh, what caused a dive to be transformed into a diving emergency and ultimately a fatality? And of those seven things that we identified in that research project, one of the most significant was buoyancy control. And so when equipment fails and the equipment itself may not fail very, very often, but when it does fail, uh, you lose buoyancy control. So you're either too buoyant or are too negative. And the one thing nice about the Abello system is that if the worst case scenario happens, you still remain uh, pretty close to neutrally buoyant. Next. So when you, when you look at these potential malfunctions, uh, the loss of weights will make you uh, more buoyant. Uh, if you get a stuck power inflator, then you're gonna be significantly buoyant. And one of the issues is that, especially with people who are new into the sport, they may not have the wherewithal to be able to deal with that rapid buoyancy change uh, and do whatever they need to do to control the buoyancy. So there's a lot of things going on at one time and that creates a situation called task loading where they may not be able to do what they need to do to correct that situation because they're overwhelmed. So you do get almost an instant upward buoyant force uh, that causes you to be uh, experiencing a rapid ascent. And with the Velo system, and the Velo system might have something which is a water leak, then that happens very, very slowly. And so we simulated those situations on the test dives that I did. Uh, and the upward force was really relatively small. And it took place over a longer period of time, which it wasn't a true emergency. So wasn't something that rapidly transformed that dive into an emergency or a dangerous situation. You had time to be able to think your way through, and there was not a significant change in buoyancy. And so you simply were able to abort the dive and return to the surface. Okay, next. Now, another possible malfunction would be where there is some sort of failure with the buoyancy compensator. And that failure could be that the bladder itself may be compromised or torn, uh, or there may be a problem with the dump valve where it won't retain uh, air and therefore won't retain the buoyancy necessary. And so in that situation, you have significant negative force, downward force, uh, making it extremely difficult to reach the surface. In fact, there was a diving accident that I was reading about not too long ago, where at the end of a dive, um, a young lady uh, decided that she was going to dump all of the air out of her buoyancy compensator because she was really concerned about the potential for a rapid ascent. So when she dumped all of the air out of her buoyancy compensator, she was significantly negatively buoyant. And then as she attempted to swim to the surface, she wasn't going anywhere and panicked and uh, came to the surface in an emergency ascent. So that can be extremely dangerous, as you can imagine. 
So with the Velo system, uh, what you have is a water overfill. And so you get a downward force, but it's not a significant downward force. It's not rapid and dramatic like you would have with a buoyancy compensator failure. And so all of that, again, develops over time, which gives you an opportunity to slowly manage that situation. Uh, and all you really need to do is then to return to the surface. And you can do that without a whole lot of trouble because you are nearly neutrally buoyant at that point. Next. Loss of battery power. So if the battery happens to fail, uh, again, there's no immediate effect on your buoyancy and your buoyancy control. So again, the, the, the nice thing about the Avello system compared to a standard buoyancy compensator, when something happens, it's not rapid and dramatic. It's slow. It gives you an opportunity to deal with the situation and it takes place over a period of time, which allows you simply to abort the dive and return to the surface. And so again, you do have a lot of time to be able to deal with that, uh, including taking the time for your safety stop. Next. I know one of the questions that uh, I had that people have contacted me about has to do with uh, testing, the testing that was done uh, on the equipment. Well, as you can see from the note on the right-hand side of the screen, uh, the bladders are tested to withstand over 85,000 cycles. And again, if you consider that as far as use is concerned, it would be decades and decades of use of the equipment. And the bladder is tested to withstand over 20,000 PSI, uh, and that's compressible force. So it can be compressed significantly without any uh, serious damage to the bladder. And Avello experimental dive teams intentionally compromised the bladders, uh, and they dove with them just to make sure they understood how it worked, and there was no serious and rapid and dramatic changes that would have created a dangerous situation. Next. So. Thank you, Dan. Um, up through here, it's really, it's a new system and we understand that the introduction of it needs to be done in how we're explaining it here. The advantages are tremendous. Everybody that we talked and we did the, the, um, the testing with a large group of pilot test participants from all levels is enamored with it. And people are, the, the most common thing that we're getting is I never want to go dive anything else again. Uh, the, but we need to explain a few more things. We designed the system to be compatible with industry standards. The hydro tank can easily hold 4350 PSI. Um, the, the industry will typically fill it only to 3000 PSI because that's what dive ships do. And if you do that, then you're going to get a tank that is similar to the aluminum 12 or the 80, as it's known in the US, and that's the standard fill. But the tank can be filled to 4350 PSI, and then you just get on the same tank 106 or, or 3000 liters if you're doing metric. We are using DIN valves, which are becoming common, they're very common in Europe. Um, then, do, do you want some, to say something about those DIN valves that we use? Oh, the DIN valve. Yeah, in fact, uh... Uh, I think the DIN valve is an excellent piece of equipment. For one thing, you have a captured O-ring, so you're less likely to blow an O-ring. Uh, and uh, unfortunately, they're not that common in the United States. And I think it's something that people really need to consider uh, because it's a much safer valve to use than a standard yoke. Yep. Um, we are enriched air compatible. That's not a problem. Um, we hydro test every five years, just like a standard scuba tank. We visually inspect every year. And although the bladder can handle tremendous abuse, um, our recommendation right now is to replace it either when needed, when you do the inspection, or every five years. Uh, it fits, we fit infrastructure and we support future improvement, but we don't want the takeaway to be that this is the system itself is different, but the way it's handled outside of the water, except it's lighter, is the same as regular standard gear. How would it work and who is Avelo? The way we work is with Avelo dive centers. And Avelo dive center is a dive shop. Um, we provide the product, which I mentioned before is DOT and C approved already. Um, we provide the diver education. We have two layers of that. We have a recreational Avelo diver. Uh, that's what all of the pilot participants did uh, then is a is a proud uh, red here yeah. and we we provide so it's not like we 
take people and we say go dive. It's a whole certification program that explains how to use the gear, safety, what to look for, and so on, just like open water. Um, the it is a specialty, so we only teach people that are already certified. And the next layer is an instructor education. Uh, the course is called Develop Pro, and that provides the tools for instructors to go and teach it as a specialty. We also service the technicians. Uh, from everything that you see in this presentation, we're essentially bringing the world of hydraulics into scuba. And that brings with it a few things that the technician would need to know about hydraulics that is different than as, as scuba. Right now, the scuba industry is very much pneumatic and air control driven. There's suddenly a new game about doing all of the buoyancy control with water. Um, or adjusting buoyancy with the use of water, which is what hydraulic is. When? We are planning to start um, introducing the system to the world in the Q1 of 2023 through adventure travel. We will start offering trips for small groups here in Maui that will be a week long. Day one will be the recreation of a velo diver, and it will be followed by a number of uh, days of diving, excuse me. Um, we already have several available dive centers here um, that are the early adopters. And we start, which it, this goes through a dive center application. It's a process. Um, and we're planning to grow throughout 2024 and introduce it into more and more locations and to grow responsibly. And with that, yeah, we thank uh, you. Yeah, this, is, I, this is the time. Yeah, can um, I? Can I make a comment? Yep. Yeah, I mean, the dives that I did uh, were in Maui. And once I was in the water, uh, I got down to uh, well, a couple of different dives who we went to 70 or 80 feet. And once I was in that zone of neutral buoyancy, I main, maintained neutral buoyancy throughout the water column. And on one of the dives, we went to 50 feet, then up to 40 feet, then up to 20 feet, and up to 10 feet, and back down to 20 feet. And there wasn't one instance when I was not neutrally buoyant. So it really was a, an unbelievable experience. And what I liked about it too, was the fact that it, it does give you an opportunity to do what we all want to do. And that is to focus on the enjoyment of the sport. So you're not fighting with the equipment, you're not overwhelmed or overloaded by all the things you have to do to control your buoyancy and adjust your buoyancy as you go up and down the water column. You can really focus on what you want to do. And if you're a photographer, uh, you can focus on the photos. In fact, I did a number of dives where I actually was hovering within inches of the bottom uh, just to see how much control I had. And all my control was then done by adjusting my, my breathing depth. Uh, and so it was really an eye-opening experience and something that I thought uh, really enhanced the enjoyment of the sport. I'll... It was an honor to have them. Yeah. I mean, well, and, and also, you know, I, I look at things from a safety standpoint, and, and what this does, it really addresses a number of safety issues in diving. For one thing, with a system like this, uh, it eliminates uh, the problem with overweighting because you are not overweighted at any point in time. And so that's one of the big issues people are experiencing. So uh, it really addresses a lot of those safety issues, addresses all the comfort issues uh, of the equipment being so heavy. Uh, and I think it really does allow us to do what we always want to do and that is have a great time underwater. Yeah, there's there's a lot more. Thank you, Dan. Um, there's, there's a lot more to this. Uh, I want to refer to a couple of questions. Uh, there was a question here about what depth has been uh, has this been tested to? So, first of all, we intended this to the entire uh, recreational and technical diving depth. That's with the intention. The system is rated to 200. Uh, we commonly dive to 100 feet and more for testing. Uh, obviously, we we tested it at a much greater depth than that um, for ability and all that, I'm not going to get into exactly the, the, the test range that it went to, but the system is rated for those depths and it can go, it's designed for recreational, it can do more. Any other questions? I 
I might add that we will be at DEMA this year. Uh, and what, when's DEMA? The first week of November, end of October? Yeah. 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 It's an early DEMA this year yeah. uh, first in Orlando. Of, yeah, uh, first and fourth of November. Right. I, I have a question about the uh, like technical question about water corrosion and all that. The tank is made out of the same materials that you have tanks today. It's a carbon fiber. This is an aluminum shell. It's exactly the same um, as the, the same materials that are exposed today to salt water are exposed to salt water with this system. There's nothing new in terms of materials compatibility. Uh, and so, and that's what allows us to, to use those systems. Um, special equipment, really a dive shop that has the, the DIN adapter, any dive shop today that we know of can fill valves that, that have a, a DIN valve in them. I don't know that, at least here, I don't know a dive shop that doesn't, but if they do, there's a 12 box piece that allows you to fill a, I think it converts from a yoke to a din, and that's for the film. Um, no other special equipment is required to fill, to refill the tanks. Uh, the tanks, by the way, are used just like standard tanks are today. They're separable from the system. You take the tank to the shop and they fill it. Um, weight of the tank, weight of the whole system. So. The whole system weighs, compared to standard scuba, it's something like 60% of the standard tank. The weight itself of the whole system, the whole system, including regulator and air and things that are beyond our control, meaning the entire load on the diver, that's an actually a good question. So let's go back to the loads table here. The load of the Avelo system fits here. It's in the 45, pounds. And when you compare it to where we are today, we are in the, we're approaching the comfortable zone. Yeah. And one of the beauties of this approach is that it can and it will become lighter because you're relying on the water to do the weight and you never need to take weights um, or, or additional weight beyond what's required for neutral buoyancy. At the beginning of the dive, there's no more weight needed. So that's where we are. It's important to look at it in terms of load and not only the weight of the system, because what we care about is for people to be comfortable and that's where we want to be. Retail price, we're not getting into retail price right now. Um, we're running, we, we're introducing this, as I said, through uh, dive trips. And what we want is to give people the experience. The dive shop themselves will be able to release the, um, prices and retail prices and all that. We work with the dive shops and the dive shop is working with the, um, the end user. The system, uh, there's a question about, can you check the, the system as luggage? Sure, you could. Our intention is really to have the dive shop works with the system and have them available for the divers when you, when you reach it. Um, this is a, it's a democratic system. It really is the same system for all divers. So it really is something that, that uh, the intention is not to have people travel, but you, you definitely could, and the system is designed for it. The battery is designed for, um, to be able to fly with it. I'll go back to the system here. Just like a standard scuba yeah. tank, you're yeah, not just, likely just like to want scuba. to fly with it. You'll, you'll rent a scuba tank, you'll rent yeah. the Velo system. Um, although I could see people wanting to fly with their own jet pack. It, mm. Yeah, people will want to fly with this, which is understandable. Um, there's upgrades to components and so on. But for right now, know that the intention is for us to play in the same vein that the, the current scuba industry uh, plays. Excellent question. Uh, recommendations for serving some maintenance of pumps. So the pump is serviced like a regulator every two years. It is a mechanical device, essentially. Um, the battery is just like a battery in any um, use in, in flashlights and um, for cable diving, for strobes. It's, there's no battery maintenance required for the battery. 
Yes, by the way, any Avelo dive center will have will be certified by us um, for all of the training required to use the system, mm -hmm. to teach the system, um, and to provide maintenance. Um, and while, while any dive shop can fill the tank, again, the way that we're approaching it is initially through trips. And so it's controlled by the Avelo dive centers. And the only way to get gear will be through uh, participating in Avelo dive centers. And so technically, any dive shop can fill it. The availability of the gear will be through Avelo dive ships. I, I, I want to ask for more questions. I think if you guys have more questions for Dan, um, please let us know because that's that's the opportunity to really talk to, to a very experienced diver about the sensation of it and about how this whole thing works and how what does it feel like underwater? Because uh, there's very there's a lot of aspects of newness into how to dive with a veil. But essentially, yeah, go ahead. I will tell you, about a month after I made the dives with the Avello system, I went uh, to Little Cayman, and there I was using uh, traditional scuba, <laughs> and it was significantly different, and I kept saying to myself, gosh, I wish I had the Avello system with me, and, and I was talking to everybody on the boat, and they were all interested in it too, but it really, it really is much lighter coming out of the water. I mean, you can really tell the difference. Could you maybe talk to us, Dan, about what your sensation was first diving the system? You'd never dove it before, so it was fresh and new. No, I mean, it was really very easy, and it was uh, certainly less complicated than uh, standard scuba, and I had no trouble whatsoever adapting to it. And uh, I know the first dive we made, it was uh, kind of a difficult dive because there was a lot of surge on the bottom, but made no difficult uh, time at all once I get inside that wreck that we were at, uh, and I was out of that surge. I mean, I was completely neutrally buoyant, and it felt, in fact, actually, the sensation I had, I kept thinking to myself what it must have been like when Cousteau first started diving, you could see those guys swimming around underwater in their silvery suits and and without any effort whatsoever. And that was the experience for them that they finally got a chance to breathe underwater and enjoy the underwater world and without having to fight with the equipment. And and that really made the difference. And And once we did some additional dives, that's when I started really experimenting with the equipment to see how it uh, acted in various scenarios and and especially once I got to the place we were going up and down in the water column and there was no change in buoyancy at all. So, and I think when we mentioned earlier that it, it really makes it easier to learn and it certainly makes it gonna make it easier for people coming back to the sport to get into the water and enjoy the sport more quickly rather than having to relearn some of those very complicated steps you might have to do with a buoyancy compensator. Yeah, and, and Dan really did stress the system. <laughs> we, we we have the logs to prove it. Uh, we record all of the dives with dive logs, and so. But really, that's that's what we wanted. Yeah. Um, and that's what I wanted so, too. And I wanted it. I really wanted to see how it performed because you know, like a lot of us in that room when we first heard about it, we were skeptical. And this really proved to me that yes, that system does work and work as it's advertised. The the I'm getting a bit more questions on boat entry. So just like regular boat. In fact, the dives that we did with Dan were all boat entry. There was no. Did you feel a difference on the boat entry? Oh, the boat entry? Yeah. Well, I mean, for one thing, it's a lot lighter. And I think being lighter made it a lot easier to get up and walk to the entry point, enter the water, and certainly made it a lot easier uh, coming up the ladder at the end of the dive. Uh, and it is, this is, this is something, you know, one thing you instructors always talk about, well, would I want my loved one to use a equipment like this or a system like this. And absolutely. I mean, if my children, they're all older and certified now, but um, if they were getting into the sport, I'd certainly want them to use a system like this. And if they uh, are continuing to dive, I'd certainly want them to try a system like this and use it. Cause I think it'd be much better for them. They'd enjoy the sport a lot more. It's, it's, it's really hard to emphasize how much better buoyancy control can be. A lot of us are instructors. I'm sure a lot of the people on this uh, webinar are instructors are very experienced people. It is magic even for us. It is really different in the sense that it's stable. You can go up to you know, the surface or go down to 200 feet. There's zero buoyancy changes. And it's something that we think that we have 
neutral buoyancy now, we do. It's just not stable. And it's a very different world in that regard. Yeah. Well, I mean, I mean, having been in the sport as long as I have, I've been in the sport for over 50 years now. And when I was uh, teaching, um, every time a new innovation would come out, one thing we'd do is we would test it to make sure that it worked as it was advertised. And that's basically what I did when I was doing the test dives there in Maui. I wanted to see how it performed uh, in every situation I could think of uh, because I wanted to make sure that uh, it would work in the worst case scenario. And I'm confident that it does. Um, plans to automate the system. Um, I'll, I'll talk about this for a second. Um, then I think this is a question is for you. Would you recommend it to very young new divers? I think you actually just answered that. Well, I think so. I, I think I would because again, it's less complicated. Uh, you don't have to worry about those dramatic potential buoyancy changes. Uh, when you enter the water, you're essentially floating at eye level. Uh, and then you start the pump and you start sinking and it, you reach that zone of neutral buoyancy and, and it's less complicated. There's less stress involved because it's less complicated. Uh, less workload because you, you're more streamlined. So absolutely, I would recommend it for anybody who's getting involved in the sport. So someone asked about the, the plans to automate. The system at this point does not need automation. It feels like it's automated, but it's manual. You touch the button, you bring yourself to neutral buoyancy. There's 20 minutes of, it doesn't matter what the depth change is, you're staying neutral. Um, so you only adjust the, the buoyancy two to three times a dive. But with that, a few things that are a bit more advanced um, is this. So if you look at the tank and it has a bladder inside and you inject water into it, you're going to compress that gas, right? So the, the first thought is, OK, air management. So the way that we do air management is relatively simple. You, you can do air management like you do today. With us, you start the system, the bladder compresses, the gas in it is compresses and the pressure goes up and you record the max pressure that you see in the dive. And then from that on, you manage it just like you manage air today. If you're a person that is used to the rule of thirds and you turn around at a third and then leave a third as reserve, you just do it based on the reference pressure, which is the highest pressure in the dive. And it works. You can dive the system with a uh, manual or, or a regular console, and it's analog, and it's all good. But it opened up the opportunity for us to do some interesting things. If you look at the Novello dive profile, you can actually record the pressure. And because we know the pressure, we can reflect how much water is in the tank. So every time that you touch that, button and you put water in the tank, there's a little blip, there's a little increase in pressure. That data can easily be translated to figure out how much um, bladder, what's the bladder volume is, which means we know how much water is in the tank. And suddenly we have all the data in the world to know exactly how close to neutral buoyancy a diver was. So we created a tool that is called the buoyancy diagram. And the buoyancy diagram can show a diver relative to perfect neutral buoyancy, how um, close they were, how positive or negative they are. And in the beginning of the dive, you can see that this diver, this is a real dive and the diver was positive. This is a force on the diver. The one thing that you see on this chart is that no worry would you find the depth. This chart is related to this dive profile, here's the depth. And you can see that the buoyancy of the diver relative to neutral has nothing to do with depth. With us, it's all about air consumption. So they went in, they put water into the tank, they brought themselves to be you know, on the negative side of the zone. The zone is actually your tidal volume. So they're on the bottom side of the zone, they're still, they're feeling perfect. Anywhere inside this area, you would feel perfectly neutral. And then you, you breathe and breathe and breathe. And that's like 30 minutes in this case almost. And then they made an adjustment. So they put a little bit more water in the tank and it went down. They should have taken it all the way down to here, but they did this. So you can see them breathing again, but they're inside the zone. And that's at the end of the dive when they purge water from the tank, they go back to be um, positive. 
This is a very powerful tool. What we're doing right now with this tool is we can actually show people that when they're inside the zone, their air consumption is great. And as soon as somebody in a regular diet goes outside of the zone of stable mature buoyancy, their air consumption very quickly start to go up. Um, we're developing those tools. This is happening right now. And while we don't need to automate the system, we have other tools that are really interesting for Avelo. Yeah, Aviad, I did see there was a question from David Colvard uh, about current. And, uh, and uh, hi, David, how you doing? Um, <laughs> but the, um, the current, the first time that we did, there was some current and there was certainly a lot of surge on the bottom. And uh, once we were in the water, I had no difficulty getting below the surface because I was essentially neutrally buoyant at the surface. Um, and once we were at the bottom, I had no difficulty maneuvering around uh, with the surge and the current that was on the bottom, partly because there was so little drag because I was streamlined. And I, I didn't have any difficulty whatsoever getting to the bottom nor staying on the bottom and staying in position um, and had no difficulty getting back to the surface, even though there was like current. Now we did use the anchor line, which is probably not a bad idea anyway, but I, I, I would recommend against uh, overweighting yourself to deal with a current. Yeah, this whole concept of overweighting oneself disappears with yeah. us. Um, Somebody asked me last webinar, I mentioned the pump runtime to add water. Yes, the run, the, the pump runtime is a minute. The, the, when you start, go back to the gear here. I think what they're asking is how many dives can you run the pump for? Oh, yeah. Oh, Charles, please confirm. <laughs> uh, we, we, I, I promise I'd answer the, the questions, but which is it? Is how many dives or? the runtime limit. You can probably answer both. Yeah. I'll answer both. Um, so when you start the button, the pump will run for a minute and it will stop. That way we know on average, you're gonna get about two pounds of water in and it's, it's, it's calibrated to um, the normal need for buoyancy. As I said, you, you go to about a pound to a pound and a half every 20 minutes. So that's what we calibrated the pump for. If you're asking about how many um, lives the battery holds, so the battery is designed to hold above and beyond the amount of uh, energy that's needed for a dive. We built it so that you could do anywhere between three and four dives for a diver that is um, that is really that knows what they're doing and it's it's a, a more experienced level diver. Um, in the beginning, you'll probably get two, maybe three dives on a battery. Our very experienced dive instructors get 10 to 11 um, dives on a battery, but it really, it, it depends with more knowledge and more getting used to that. That's the, the you can do a lot more dives on a battery. Um, I showed them when he dove, even after Dan was trying to break our system here, uh, even then the, the battery, I mean, he used 15% of the, of the charge, even intentionally trying to, to run. Um, it takes between 40 and 50 minutes to, to charge a battery for a period of time, but really within 20, uh, far less than, in, than a dive interval, you get this battery back to 80, 85% um, very quickly. So, uh, you know, the normal charge will be 40 to 50 minutes, within 20 to 30 minutes, you're good for, at least a dive, if not more, um, if you really needed to, to recharge a battery quickly. Our plan is you do a day of diving and you recharge the battery at night. That, that's what the system is designed for. I think we can do this, all the information in the world. <laughs> well, we are coming up on the hour, so, and we're taking up people's Happy Fridays. Okay. Be happy with us this evening, I guess. And and people can always reach out to me if they have any further questions. Yeah, please. And Aviad as well, so they can reach out to all of us. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you much for um, joining us. Yeah. Thank you for joining us this evening. Uh, you can. 
follow up with us as Novello Insider. You can send us emails if you want to send more information. Dan's on uh, Facebook as is Avello. And maybe we'll even see you at a future dive seminar such as DEMA in November or uh, even diving talks in Portugal, if you're familiar with that, October 7 through 9. Uh, we will be participating in that conference as well. And maybe next year we'll see you on the island uh, diving the system where you can try it out for yourself. Get experience on it. It is a great experience. Yeah, yeah that, that's the one thing I will leave you is that the, the trips are designed for that. So it's not just the one day and get certified. It's really a way to experience the system for real. Yep. If you didn't uh, catch earlier, uh, Aviad introduced that we will be offering uh, a Velo dive trips that will be a week long uh, excursion in which the first day you earn the RAD specialty certification and then the following days you get to dive Maui. <laughs> yep. Cool, guys. Thank you much. Thank you, Dan, for joining us this evening. Yeah. Thank you, Brian. I got muted somehow. People have been trying to mute me for years. <laughs> well, thank you all very much. And uh, contact us if you have any questions. <laughs>